Thank you, Pierre. Uh, and I wanted to congratulate Pierre and Mike Millis on putting together this course. Um, thank the audience for coming. Um, and, and thank the other speakers as well. I think uh, this course being popular really reflects two things. I think one is uh, how much hip pathology has evolved in our understanding and treatment of hip pathology. Um, I think when I was training, we used to probably think that in the younger patient, hip pain was uh, a groin pull, and in the older patient, it was arthritis, and you needed a hip replacement, and things have come a long way since then. Um, the other thing I think it reflects is really the multidisciplinary nature of treatment of these problems, and I think you've heard that through these talks, uh, how it uh, includes surgeons, primary care, sports medicine physicians, therapists, rehab, uh, imaging to really get this right. Um, I was asked to talk about hip arthroscopy in the high-level athlete in return to play, and it's a bit of a difficult talk because many of these concepts have been talked about in other talks uh, in terms of pathology. Uh, and it's really a very mixed audience. I see a lot of therapists and trainers here, primary care sports medicine docs, and uh, some orthopedic surgeons as well. So I'll try to give uh, some personal experience uh, and some tips. Let's see. Uh, my disclosures are shown here. I don't think there's any specific conflicts with this talk. Uh, and my goals are to discuss the differential diagnosis of hip pain in the high-level athlete, overview the utility of hip arthroscopy, discuss some return to play criteria, and the format I thought I would take is to give you some take-home messages instead of a long uh, type of didactic lecture. Uh, my personal interest in hip arthroscopy has been longstanding. We wrote an article uh, in 1992 when I was finishing medical school. Uh, I learned hip arthroscopy in fellowship in 1999 uh, and then came back on staff in 2000 and done over 1,000 hip arthroscopies. And it's a variety of indications as shown on the right, probably the most common being FAI, labral tears, <coughs> loose bodies, and chondral flaps. Um, so we'll start with some take-home messages. The first take-home message uh, I want to give you is that not all labral tears are symptomatic. Uh, it used to be common in my clinic that we'd have patients coming in, you know, with five or six years of hip pain being managed in different ways before we finally got an MRI arthrogram, saw a labral tear, and we looked very smart. Now it's almost flipped the other way. We see lots of patients coming into clinic already with an MRI arthrogram, many without x-rays at all. Uh, and they're being referred for a labral tear. So the question is, are we actually over-diagnosing this? Has the pendulum switched? Um, when we see this patient, I think it's very important, even if they're sent in with an MRI showing a labral tear, to figure out what their real diagnosis is. And we do this you know, through some old tech things, history, physical exam, location of their pain, um, and what treatment they've had. Imagine if you did an MRI arthrogram on your athlete population. So if you're a trainer, your college hockey team, your high school football team, uh, your uh, ballet dancers, uh, and you took asymptomatic patients and did MRI arthrograms on them, uh, what percentage would have a labral tear um, without any symptoms at all? And it's probably pretty high. It's actually up to 10% to 30% in certain populations. So we need to take, I think, our MRI arthrograms with a grain of salt. This 25-year-old dancer referred for a labral tear, actually had iliopsoas tendonitis, was treated with injections, physical therapy, and did well. Um, but, you know, a, you might have operated on her and scoped her hip for a labral tear. This 21-year-old hockey player was also sent in with a labral tear, but he had adductor tendonitis, which was recalcitrant, also treated with therapy and injections and did well without hip arthroscopy. So the pearls are, you know, where is the location of the pain? What are the symptoms? How long have they been going on for? A physical exam, which has been talked about, imaging, which has been talked about, a try non-operative treatment um, for many of these conditions, and intraarticular injections can be very helpful to see if the source of the pain is coming from the joint. And we've talked about some of these diagnoses that are occurring actually outside the joint uh, and may be confused with um, a labral tear, particularly when you have a patient uh, with an MRI with a labral tear. Another take-home uh, message is that not all hip pain is a labral tear, so there's other pathology, and we see these in the high-level athlete. Um, some of these have been talked about, but I think it's worth reiterating because they're very common injuries that we see in clinic. The high-level adolescent athlete who's tight coming in with an apophyseal avulsion fracture around the pelvis, mm -hmm. the ASIS, AIIS, or ischial tuberosity, um, this is treated, as you know, non-operatively uh, with generally good results. 
Two problem avulsion fractures include the ischial tuberosity fracture where you may have a big fragment that's displaced um, and this can cause persistent pain. The sciatic nerve can be draped over these fragments which can be challenging. The other one is the anterior inferior iliac spine that can heal with a hook type deformity um, that can lead to impingement and this can be treated uh, with uh, uh, osteoplasty either arthroscopically or open. A bursitis was talked about as well. I think we see a lot of patients sent in with a quote labral tear uh, who actually have bursitis. It can be iliopsoas bursitis presenting as a deep anterior groin pain uh, or it can be trochanteric bursitis presenting as lateral pain with or without snapping um, and so beware of these as well uh, and these were discussed. Psoas release Dr. Yen just uh, showed you a video of. Um, one thing about the psoas release, we published this uh, study with a hip arthroscopy study group looking at over 25,000 cases of hip arthroscopy, and we saw this complication of intra-abdominal fluid extravasation. So you uh, cut the iliopsoas tendon, but the fluid can travel up the iliopsoas sheath into the pelvis, and you can accumulate a large amount of fluid in the pelvis, and this actually has resulted in deaths or major catastrophic injuries. Um, so be careful of this if you're doing an iliopsoas tenotomy, particularly under high pump pressures. A stress fracture, this is an old school diagnosis, but we still see a lot of patients with stress fractures, and some patients with impingement may actually be more predisposed to getting a femoral neck stress fracture. Um, and so, uh, you know, we often diagnose these with MRI uh, or bone scan, uh, not necessarily an MRI arthrogram and uh, think about their bone density when you're seeing these patients. Hip dislocation, uh, acute hip dislocation is a pretty obvious thing. Um, I think we see some uh, subacute or an injury to the hip with a reduction um, spontaneously, which can be uh, more difficult to diagnose. Um, many of these episodes of instability can result in shear fractures uh, off the femoral head or the acetabulum, and we can treat these arthroscopically for the smaller pieces with resection uh, and microfracture on the femoral head. And something we're seeing more and more in our high-level athletes are, are pathology of the gluteus medius, so pain and the lateral hip weakness. Uh, this may be an occurrence with intraarticular hip pathology. Uh, and we're seeing tears of the gluteus medius, the so-called rotator cuff of the hip. Um, so we're seeing these more uh, now and treating them either in isolation uh, or in association with intraarticular pathology with repair of the gluteus medius, much like you'd repair rotator cuff tendon. Another take-home message is that I think FAI is probably the most common uh, hip pathology that we're seeing now in the high-level athletes. So I think if you leave here with one understanding from this course, I think it would be an understanding of what FAI is, um, how it's diagnosed, and how it's managed. Um, and you've seen probably these pictures of the hip where we have pincer impingement with uh, acetabular retroversion, over coverage of the socket towards the front of the joint, cam impingement with a lack of offset at the anterolateral femoral head neck junction, and mixed impingement both cam and pincer. Uh, we see these in younger patients as well, even into adolescence and childhood. Um, so we can see cam impingement, uh, and this relates to the proximal femoral physis. We just completed a study uh, of that with Sarah Bixby. Uh, and when you resect the cam impingement in these patients, uh, you may see the, the femoral physis. And so here, uh, as we're resecting that cam impingement, So as we're resecting that cam impingement, you'll see the physis of the proximal femur. Um, so we do see this in younger and younger patients. Um, case study of a patient, a hockey player um, with bilateral mixed uh, impingement um, with labral tearing and a chondral flap that we treated arthroscopically um, with labral repair, uh, refixation, rim trimming, uh, and osteoplasty at the femoral head and neck junction. I'm not going to show you videos of that. Um, Dr. Yen just discussed this. Another take-home message <laughs> that I've learned is that insurance companies are crazy, and uh, it really is baffling. I think uh, our fellows spend a fair amount of time on the phone doing peer-to-peers. I see them nodding their heads um, with insurance company doctors who are usually like retired pathologists or something um, about getting uh, these procedures, imaging, or physical therapy approved. So this is these are some of the medical policies. This is from. Anthem, Blue Cross, Blue Shield. Uh, and so here they will approve um, if you've had six months, let me see this. So number three, 
says individual has failed conservative therapy for a duration of at least six months, including activity modification with restriction of athletic pursuits, uh, if any, that include avoidance of symptomatic movements. And so we did a Harvard hockey player yesterday, hip arthroscopy, and we struggled with this. Um, because she really struggled during the season, had to miss much of her season. She'd been treated with injections, physical therapy. Uh, and so they wanted her to have six months of no skating. Uh, and she had a large cam, pincer impingement, labral tear, chondral flap. She could not skate for six months, but the day, six months and one day, she's going to have pain again. Um, and she's going to miss her next season. And so um, this is a little bit baffling, and so we have to run into this. Um, this is another uh, uh, recommendation from insurance in terms of approval for surgeries or procedures where the adolescent patient should be skeletally mature uh, with closure of the growth plates. Now, we know we see uh, femoral acetabular impingement in adolescents with open growth plates. They may already have a labral tear and chondral pathology, so should we just give them another few years to beat up their joint before they can have surgery? And what about this 55-year-old patient? I agree that 55-year-old patients with arthritis shouldn't be having hip arthroscopy, but what about the 55-year-old patient who has no arthritis, has a labral tear and impingement? Those are some of the most satisfied patients because uh, they've been bounced around. So some of these are vexing. Um, this was a patient uh, that we also did yesterday who was a college uh, hockey player who uh, the insurance company said we could repair the labrum, um, but we couldn't do an osteoplasty. Um, and so that was a little confusing. So we're going to repair the labrum, not deal with the underlying structural abnormality, and the patient's going to run into more problems. So, of course, we, we did do the osteoplasty, and, and we won't get reimbursed for it, which is fine. Um, but it's difficult sometimes to explain these concepts um, to the pathologist who's retired on the phone. Uh, <laughs> this patient also was approved for 20 sessions of physical therapy for the year. So we're going to treat this patient with a complex hip problem, and now they've got 20 sessions of physical therapy uh, for the whole year. Many patients can have surgery in the postseason. So uh, labral tears, femoral acetabular impingement in the high-level athlete is often not a season-ending injury, um, like an ACL tear or some other injuries that we see. So many of these patients we can get through the season uh, with modifying their activity, injections, manual techniques, uh, et cetera, uh, maybe minimizing how much they do in practice, doing more in games. Uh, and then do their surgery at the end of the season. So we see this rush of football players at the end of fall, these hockey players at the end of um, winter as well. Um, some patients, I think, are really struggling, and they're not playing effectively. And so if we're injecting them, doing things to try to get them through the season, but they're really in a lot of pain and not playing effectively, sometimes we call it quits during the season. But I would say most of these patients can have surgery uh, after the season through these different modalities. I think these athletes really need to understand the short-term goals and the long-term goals. Um, and so short-term, our goals are to treat their pathology anatomically and get them back to a higher functional level and return to sports. But we also are concerned about their hip health for the long term. So what is their risk of arthritis? What's the risk of continued problems, need for further surgery? And I think many of these athletes come in uh, with uh, the concept of other sports injuries where we can uh, fix the meniscus and they're fine. Um, but really in the hip, I think uh, we're just learning about this. And so by treating the underlying impingement in patients with labral tear and FAI, that should help protect the hip. We don't have great data to show that. Uh, over a longer term, um, but I think those data are coming. But the patient needs to be informed both about what the short-term goal is in terms of return to sports and the longer-term health of the hip. Labral debridement versus labral repair. I think the pendulum has really shifted. I think originally in hip arthroscopy there was a lot of labral debridement. Now I think the focus is on labral repair. Uh, Dr. Yen talked about this as well. Uh, and Dr. Millis, the function of the labrum uh, as a seal extending the bony acetabulum uh, probably has some mechanical uh, contact force uh, function as well, uh, and the vascularity uh, and uh, uh, other functions of the labrum are being better understood. Um, I think the clinical results are starting to show uh, that patients with labral repair refixation do better than patients with labral debridement. Uh, and so that's been the emphasis, and that's been my shifting emphasis uh, as well. Uh, labral reconstruction, so this isn't a patient who's had debridement to uh, try to make a new labrum. Um, I think this is experimental. 
Um, we'll have to see what the results of this are uh, over the longer term. Uh, so not quite established yet. And sometimes there's technical considerations. We may want to do a labral repair refixation, but the tissue is very shredded and essentially gone, uh, and there isn't an indication to do a labral repair. But I think in general with your patients, if you're sending them to surgeons, uh, make sure that they're uh, getting a labral repair if they can, uh, and they're treating the underlying pathology. The results in the high-level athlete uh, take-home message, they're really dependent on the procedure and the pathology. And so there have been multiple studies now published, small retrospective case series in professional athletes, including football, hockey, basketball, baseball, soccer, and ski racing, looking at outcome in terms of functional outcome scores and return to play. And the results are 18% to 94% success rates in terms of return to play. So I think patients feel pretty good when you tell them that their success rate's going to be 18 to 94 percent. That's a very wide range. That's much wider than many of the procedures that we do. And part of the reason why is that the outcomes really depend on what procedure is being done and what the pathology is. You've heard this a lot today, and so you need to treat the underlying structural abnormality. If we go in and just treat a labral tear, but don't recognize the femoral acetabular impingement or the deep socket or the hip dysplasia, um, the patient may do well in the very short run, but they're not going to do well in the longer run. So what is um, the underlying structural issue? The other is the underlying pathology. So this patient with labral tear with some uh, chondral fraying at the chondral labral junction, but no delamination or full thickness chondral defect is gonna do much better than this patient with femoral acetabular impingement who already has a very broad grade four chondral defect on the acetabulum. So once you start to have a full thickness chondral loss, the results of hip arthroscopy uh, and for open surgical treatment for that matter, um, get much worse. And so the results really need to be stratified based on what was done with the patient and what the underlying pathology is. We get asked this a lot, why do you get femoral acetabular impingement? And it's either uh, you know because the hip was programmed to grow that way or it's developmental. The hip developed that way as it was growing. Uh, and it could be from stress along the physis that heals with extra bone or reorientation uh, within the hip. We don't know unless we had x-rays of the patient every year growing up. Um, and so we have to um, uh, sort of guess which, why the patient got the FAI in the first place. We certainly see families in which FAI seems to run in the family uh, and early arthritis from FAI runs in the family. In other cases, we see a patient like this with fairly normal hip anatomy, a skinny, thin, tall, 13-year-old basketball player who just had a growth spurt. She had hip pain. Her MRI uh, is showing some stress at the physis um, and then some deformity at the femoral head. This is not our typical skiffy type of patient. She was treated with an activity restriction. Uh, she then went on to develop some deformity um, near where her physis was um, with labral tearing, labral pathology. She already has chondral loss at the chondral labral junction of the acetabulum. Uh, and detachment tearing of the labrum. Uh, you can see her bump here. She was treated um, with osteochondroplasty and labral repair. And this may be similar to the situation we see in the shoulder, uh, in Little Leaguer's shoulder, which is a repetitive rotation torque stress fracture, if you will, of the proximal humeral physis that results in deformity, so increased retroversion or external rotation of the shoulder. And we may be seeing a similar thing in some of these younger patients, particularly the dancers uh, or the hockey players that are playing year-round uh, at high intensities. Another take-home message is that FAI anatomy can be asymptomatic. So I talked about how an MRI showing a patient with a labral tear they may be asymptomatic from their labral tear. They may be symptomatic from something else. And the same goes for patients with FAI anatomy. Um, so the more time I spent with Dr. Millis uh, as a mentor, uh, the less I think I saw a normal hip x-ray. Uh, and now I don't know if I know what a normal hip x-ray is, kind of like Dr. Yen said, he, he doesn't know what a normal hip looks like when we scope them. Uh, and that's because some of these things are very subtle. Um, there has been some uh, uh, skepticism about hip arthroscopy for femoral acetabular impingement, and I think in part that's because FAI anatomy may be relatively common, and we need to figure out which patients are having symptoms and pathology based on that anatomy. FAI anatomy is common in normal asymptomatic populations, and FAI represents a spectrum. 
Uh, in these studies, this was 100 HIPS asymptomatic patients. Um, FAI was present in 40% of these HIPS. They had CT scans for abdominal pain. Um, this is 419 CT scans, again, for abdominal pain, uh, and 28.8% in the males are showing CAM FAI and 12% in the females. 200 asymptomatic Canadian volunteers, average age of 29, had MRIs, um, which showed labral tearing and CAM impingement in 14%, and again, these are asymptomatic patients. So FAI anatomy is common in normal asymptomatic populations. If you take specific populations now, um, or say patients with hip arthritis, uh, it's even more common. So in large databases from joint registries that look at patients who are getting hip replacement, pincer impingement is common, cam impingement is common as well. So there's this association with arthritis. And then what about specific athletic populations? Uh, so in hockey players um, with adductor pain, 94% of these have radiographic FAI. Uh, in college football players at the combine uh, for the NFL, uh, without symptoms, 95% of them have prevalence of FAI. And in elite soccer players, 67% of them have prevalence of FAI. So in fact, FAI anatomy may be normal in these high-level uh, athletes in certain athletic populations. So just because they have the anatomy doesn't necessarily mean they have the pathology. Uh, certain features of this anatomy may be more likely to be associated with symptoms. This was a study that we did with a hip arthroscopy study group of 1,000 consecutive hips, and these are in patients who are getting treated, uh, where we looked at radiographic features of CAM and pincer-type uh, femoris tabular impingement uh, and hip dysplasia. And as you would imagine, a large majority of these patients being treated largely for their labral tears uh, have FAI, 90% and 6% had radiographic findings of hip dysplasia. What things are important, though, when you look at the imaging? The alpha angle related to CAM FAI seemed to be very important. So the degree of symptoms in the patient uh, had a strong correlation through regression uh, with the alpha angle uh, that was found on imaging. Uh, so when we're looking at imaging and reading reports, um, pay some heed to what the alpha angle is. And other clinical studies have shown that larger alpha angles uh, are associated with decreased motion uh, and more advanced findings related to the articular cartilage, uh, such as delamination uh, and full thickness chondral defects, as shown here. So FAI anatomy versus pathology or symptoms, I think this is a difficult situation. It's something we have to sort through when we're seeing these patients. Um, and so we see a hockey player with an adductor strain, um, but he has FAI anatomy, but he, that's not his, why he's presenting. A dancer with iliopsoas tendonitis. A soccer player with a sports hernia with a positive MRI showing a labral tear has pathology, um, but uh, it's not from uh, his FAI. And then finally, the football player with labral tear hip pain and pathology due uh, to his FAI. We want to avoid operating here. So these are patients with FAI anatomy who don't necessarily have pathology or symptoms. But what we struggle with is once they have pathology, are we operating too early or do we wait for symptoms and then there's damage to the hip and now uh, the situation is too late? Um, the high-level athlete is now extending into children and adolescents. I don't think I see a child or adolescent who's not a high-level athlete or an elite athlete <laughs> or an all-star coat. So these are now high-level athletes as well. Or certainly their parents believe them to be high-level athletes. Um, and so what's the role of hip arthroscopy in children and adolescents? Um, we do see the pathology that we've talked about in the adult hip, um, and we see pathology in the child and adolescent hip as well. We talked about some of these conditions, apophyseal avulsions, hip dysplasia, slipped epiphysis, uh, Perthes disease, skiffy, um, and then growth disturbances. And so these are all uh, things that are unique in the younger population. Um, we published our results on hip arthroscopy in children and adolescents early on in 2005, showing 83% of patients improved with good functional outcome. And we recently published on complications. One of the concerns on doing hip arthroscopy in children and adolescents was the risk of injury to the growth plate uh, or avascular necrosis. And in 229 hip arthroscopies, uh, we didn't see this. And so uh, this does appear in some cases to be safe and effective in children and adolescents. Another take-home message will be sport-specific pathology. Uh, and so we need to think about what sport your patient is doing. So what is the hip doing in these patients 
uh, who are dancers. And so these patients are patients who are largely flexible. They may be hyperlax. They actually may have some acetabular dysplasia. That's why they can turn out so, mu so much. Uh, and along with Professor Solomon, we looked up our early results with hip arthroscopy and professional dancers, and we, were, we found that we were able to return 95% of these professional dancers uh, to sports and activities. We recently published our results of hip arthroscopy for labral tears in rowers who are getting into a deeply flexed position and then extending their hip from a deeply flexed position, and we have impressed now uh, our studies on hip arthroscopy for labral tears in field hockey players who are largely bent over and running uh, in a already flexed position. Uh, hockey, I think, is very unique. So hockey, uh, hip pain and groin pain is very, very common uh, and usually non-contact. Um, there's a variety of diagnoses, including labral tears and FAI, but also including adductor problems, sports hernia, uh, and other types of muscle problems. Uh, Dr. Demacourt <laughs> talked about sports hernia. I think this can be a difficult differentiation for us sometimes in the clinic. Um, we need to go by the history physical exam. And in these cases, I think selective injection. So if you inject in the joint with lidocaine, re-examine the hip and their pain's resolved, uh, that helps you know that the source of pain is intra-articular. Uh, my final things I want to talk about are rehabilitation and return to play. So proper rehabilitation after hip arthroscopy is essential. I think it's as essential as the surgery that we do. Uh, and hip arthroscopy rehab should not be physical therapy prescription for range of motion and strength. It needs to be a protocol. That protocol needs, and our protocol specifies what the patient's doing at each week after surgery. That protocol needs to be modified based on what was done at the time of surgery. And that protocol needs to be living. It needs to change. It needs to get updated based on our relationships with physical therapists, trainers, and the patients themselves. We learn from what they could do when, what they did and caused trouble, uh, tips that therapists have found. And these have all been very helpful, these relationships and communication in terms of this evolving rehabilitation protocol. In the initial phase, we're protecting the patient with crutches, sometimes bracing, um, to protect our repair. We then want to work on range of motion and strength, and we want to avoid long arc uh, uh, movements and loading. Um, there are specific things that seem to really irritate the hip, like straight leg raises, leg raises with ankle weights, um, and uh, um, stair-stepping type machines. Uh, water has been very helpful, and that's something I think we're learning more about. Um, then tailoring our rehab to the specific sport, avoiding pivoting and deep flexion uh, until later in their recovery, and then focusing on core balance, strengthening the gluteus medius, avoiding deep squats and deep lunges as they return to sports. Return to play also should be individualized. And so these are different return to play criteria that are in the literature after hip arthroscopy for labral tears and femoral acetabular impingement, three months, four months, six months, 12 months. What's the right answer? The answer is there is no right answer. It depends on the patient. It depends on what was done at their surgery, and it depends on ready, when they're ready to return to play. I have had patients go back to sports at three and four months after surgery, and I've had others who've taken 12 months or 24 months till they can get back to sports and activities. So just like we've developed in the knee, uh, a knee report card with functional criteria about when they're ready to go back to sports and activities based on their strength, motion, hop tests, other functional tests, we need to develop these in the hip as well so we know when these patients can return to play. When we're looking at a patient and seeing if they're ready to return to play, we're gonna look at their pain, um, their range of motion, their strength, um, how they've been doing with simulated sport-specific activities. When we do let them return, that's gonna be gradual and stepwise. Um, we need to look at their symptoms as they're returning. Uh, it's very important to stay in touch with the therapists and trainers as they're returning because lots of little things pop up. And if we nip these in the bud, we can settle them down and keep them on their rehab protocol. If we don't, then they tend, the hip tends to become inflamed. We call a hot hip that we have to cool off with injections and, and uh, setting them back on their rehab. Anti-inflammatories can be helpful. Injections can be helpful after surgery. Uh, we don't want to get them back too soon and have re-injuries. And these are not patients that have their surgery, come back at three months and six months, and then we say, you know, we'll see you back uh, as needed. You're gone. You're doing great. These are patients I think we should be following up every year. We need to follow them every, up every year to see how they're doing as they return to sports, but also how are they doing <laughs> long-term in terms of their risk of arthritis and further problems in the hip. So my goals were here in 30 minutes to discuss a differential diagnosis in the high-level athlete, overview the utility of hip arthroscopy, 
and to discuss return to play criteria. I wanted to do this more as take home type of messages uh, than a didactic talk. Um, I would say that hip injury treatment and diagnosis is certainly evolving. I think we need a careful diagnosis, uh, a multidisciplinary approach as you've seen here today, and both open and arthroscopic surgery that's appropriate for the underlying pathology. Think like any new technology <coughs> can be overly pessimistic uh, or overly zealous with hip arthroscopy. I think a balanced approach as we're trying to show here uh, in sports medicine and the young adult hip unit at Boston Children's Hospital is essential. Thank you.